Good morning. I'm Kim Kagan. I'm a founder and president of the Institute for the Study of War, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you today uh, to this fantastic webinar uh, and to host General John Allen, uh, General uh, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, and then Professor Julian Lindley French uh, to discuss their new book, uh, Future of War and the Defense of Europe. It is a fantastic book. Uh, I can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, the book offers a major new analysis of how peace and security can be maintained in Europe. Uh, and it really begins uh, by focusing on the challenges that the COVID pandemic um, has imposed on all of us uh, and then shows uh, how even prior to the pandemic, uh, the United States and its European allies uh, faced profound security challenges uh, and uh, profound challenges being prepared uh, for the uh, future contingencies uh, that will, in fact, um, jeopardize our national security, our, our liberty, and our well being. Um, and so I I'm going to introduce very quickly our distinguished guests who frankly need no introduction. General John Allen is the president of the Brookings Institution. Uh, he is a retired US Marine Corps four-star general. Uh, he served as commander of the NATO International Security Assistance Force uh, in Kabul. Um, and I had the great privilege of working with him in Kabul early in his tenure. Uh, he is truly a fantastic leader um, and a fantastic human being. Uh, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges is the Pershing Chair in Strategic Studies at the Center for European Policy Analysis. Uh, he's um, retired from the United States Army. Uh, after almost 40 years of service and his last military assignment was as commander of US Army uh, Europe, um, which I think was 2014 to 2017. Um, I think uh, Ben and I met first in Kandahar, Afghanistan, uh, which is always a great place to meet new people. Um, and then Professor Julian Lindley French uh, is a wonderful writer. Uh, he's the founder and chair of the Alphen Group uh, which is a high level uh, strategic, well, not think tank, uh, he calls it a do tank. And I, I really do think uh, he does. Um, he is a distinguished visiting research fellow at the National Defense University uh, among his other uh, wonderful and distinguished po posts. And so you can see that the breadth of experience that uh, these three authors bring uh, when they write about the future of war and the defense of Europe uh, is really unparalleled. Today, we are going to record this conversation uh, and we will upload it to the ISW YouTube site in the near future. Uh, and so I want to welcome those guests who will actually join us later on YouTube. Uh, but thank you so much to uh, John, Julian, and Ben uh, for joining us. What uh, I will do is throw a few questions out at them, and then we want uh, your questions, audience. Uh, you are an informed audience, and we know you have tons of them. Uh, and Jennifer Caffarella, the National Security Fellow at the Institute for the Study of War, will help manage the question queue and make sure uh, that we get to your audience questions as soon as possible. Um, so let me begin. Uh, Julian, you open uh, this incredible book uh, with a really alarming scenario. Please describe the scenario uh, and why you chose it as the opening of the book. Julian, you're, you're muted. I always get that wrong. <laughs> good afternoon from the Netherlands. It's good to be with you all. Um, look, the book is really, a warning. It's about denial. And, and over here in Europe, there's a lot of that. The scenario was chosen because it covers all the areas of concern that we as authors had about the, 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 the rapid changing in the balance of power, uh, changes of strategy, a lack of political cohesion in Europe, uh, the impact on the battle space of new technologies, um, 
creating forces which look more effective than they are, which is in, often the case uh, in Europe, the appearance of force rather than the fact of it. I'm, a, I'm an Oxford historian by training and I read all the cabinet minutes between 1933 uh, and 1941 at Oxford when I was writing my thesis. And I was struck by similarities between that period of, of pre-war Britain and the extent to which European leaders are distracted. So the scenario was a way of capturing their imagination uh, and capturing the imagination of the reader and, and, and leading the reader into the very serious issues which we then address in the book. And it wasn't just uh, uh, Western Europeans who suffered from this. Uh, 80 years ago this week, Hitler unleashed Operation Barbarossa on the Soviet Union. Uh, whilst much of the, the, the Wehrmacht, the German army, was unmodernized, crucially, its spear tip was very modernized, combining air power, armor, and, and, and infantry into what's known as Blitzkrieg. And its effect against an unmodernized uh, uh, Red Army, partially mobilized, with a leadership that was in denial about the possibility, even though British intelligence had warned them that the, the Wehrmacht was building up its forces. History records, which is the, 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 the Nazis had momentum for some six months and caused untold damage before eventually they were expelled from the Soviet Union. So this is uh, a recurring theme throughout European history. And we felt, given the changes that we identified, that we should use a very graphic image to, 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 to make that statement. Kim? You're muted, Kim. Indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, I found the scenario uh, really interesting and frightening. Uh, because it really talks about um, the ways in which uh, we, the United States, we, Europe, can be surprised um, by the scale and speed uh, of uh, future war and how it is that we really, um, we may think uh, that we're ready, uh, but um, that we're, we may be ready for a challenge that's past rather than a challenge that's uh, future. Um, I'd love uh, to ask John, um, should the United States be preparing uh, for a, a scenario so alarming? Uh, one, uh, of, one that transpires in, in Europe, uh, one that transpires uh, globally, um, and one that's scary. Yeah. Well, first, uh... To my colleagues, it's great to see you all on the other side of the pond. Kim, it is, uh, it's just wonderful to see you. And, and uh, for your audience, <clears throat> I, I first met Kim uh, and Fred, but Kim in particular, I met her in the Al Anbar province in 2007 during the worst of the fighting there. And uh, the, the wisdom that they brought as they were helping us to understand the tribes and the counterattack, the tribal counterattack against Al Qaeda was, was very helpful. They would later work with me in Afghanistan Kim said with, sometimes I felt like I was working for uh, as the commander uh, for them. But I also have to tell the, uh, the audience how extraordinarily important the Institute for the Study of War is to this entire conversation about the study of war. Uh, but at this inflection point, I truly believe we are at one, uh, an inflection point where this Institute, ISW, <clears throat> is gonna be critical to our getting this right going forward, which, which actually flows directly, Kim, into your, into your question. I, uh, as Julian uh, related to history, I'll relate to history as well. And, and uh, uh, what we have seen uh, in the context of the Clausewitzian principles of the character and the nature of war, where the character is the technology and the nature is the human capacity, uh, when these get out of whack, when they lose their equilibrium, uh, often strategic surprise uh, and catastrophe is the outcome. And I really worry that uh, we're approaching that moment uh, where we are so out of whack with respect to our human understanding uh, of conflict writ large, multi-domain, cross-domain conflict, uh, emerging and changing technologies. And it's not just that technology uh, is changing. It is the rate of change of technology, which offers capabilities that we could never have imagined. Uh, and that, in the context of the character of war, it's really at a gallop right now. But the problem is that the, in the nature of war, the context of how we understand conflict, to the, to the point of your organization, how we understand conflict and how we are prepared to embrace those technologies to achieve uh, relative advantage. Now, um, I said I've got a historical context in this regard. Um, 
two emerging technologies had direct effect on my family. One was wielded uh, by our opponents, by the enemy, in, a, in, in less than an optimal way and never really received or never achieved the kind of decisiveness that it could have. But the other technology was nearly indecisive. The first was my grandfather's experience with German poison gas. Uh, he was permanently disabled from those early attacks, but the, the, the new technology, really revolutionary technology, was never wielded in a manner to achieve decision because it, they, they failed to create the all arms capacity to exploit uh, that capability. The other emerging technology that uh, was nearly decisive uh, was the German U-boat. Uh, and my father uh, was on the USS Kearney. Uh, and anyone who's seen the movie uh, Greyhound, that was his experience, except that my father's experience before World War II, secretly convoying British convoys uh, against the U-boat threat. He was torpedoed uh, by a German U-boat. So here we have two really dramatic advances in technology. One, because uh, the German Wehrmacht uh, and the Navy, Kriegsmarine, had the capacity to understand the full potential, nearly strangled Britain uh, in its capacity to hold on in, in the war. The other technology, which was really revolutionary by virtue of a lack of innovation, capacity to understand how it could influence conflict, uh, was really a, a challenge. So to your question specifically, uh, I think we don't truly understand in both the defense circles in the United States, although I think we're making attempts to understand it, and certainly in Europe, we don't understand the full potential uh, of these technologies as we move as we move forward and understand the inherent nearly moral commitment that we have to make to embrace these technologies, to bring them into our understanding of the evolving conflict, whether it is hybrid or the cyber domain or in this concept called hyperwar, how these technologies can best be wielded uh, ultimately to achieve advantage given the, the natural acceleration which conflict will ultimately take. And the final point I'll make is that, look, the private sector in many respects is going to be the key here. And where we found where we have found historically the failure of advanced military capabilities to have the kinds of to achieve the kinds of effects that the opponent or the United States would have wanted was because of our incapacity to bring the private sector more deeply into the industrial commitment necessary uh, to keep the nation's production and replacement requirements going. And at a, at a hyperwar environment, that separation, that linear separation of the private sector from production and the linear separation from the private sector from the concept of requirements development, from, uh, from concept to deployment, that, that linear uh, separation is a strategic vulnerability. And it's at work every day in Europe. Uh, and it's at work every day in the United States. I think we're trying to close that gap, uh, but that's going to be a, a major challenge because our opponents, by the way, don't suffer from that same problem. I'll stop there. Thank you. You you used a term that uh, I'm familiar with because uh, I I speak uh, with you and um, I I want to make sure our audience understands. Uh, you spoke spoke about hyperwar, uh, and I do want to make sure uh, that you define the term. Uh, it is an important component uh, of what uh, the book discusses. Um, although uh, the book discusses really uh, how hyperwar uh, could come into play uh, in a scenario in, in, uh, involving the United States, Europe, uh, and indeed Beijing um, in, a, uh, in a conflict uh, that, that we really don't see coming. Sure. Um, so hyperwar. Yeah, look, um... As we know, certainly as uh, as the ISW has taught for many years, and Jenny is I've heard her in public many times. She's the perfect example of how you got it right. Um, Hyperwar uh, will be an acceleration of the nature of conflict to a point where the the kinds of technologies involved will compete with the actual presence of uh, the human being, uh, either in the decision loop or the application of force. And we've seen this before. Uh, and hyperwar really isn't about artificial intelligence, although some would attempt to ascribe that to the conflict. It's about the acceleration of the conflict to a point where one side or the other uh, is morally collapsed because they're unable any longer to keep up. And I think we saw that just a, one of, of many examples. We saw that very clearly 
uh, with the concept of Blitzkrieg uh, in the interwar years, where uh, visionary officers who understood the potential for the speed of relatively lightly armored vehicles uh, connected to each other and to uh, higher command through this new innovation of wireless radio, supported by uh, air ground communications and the capacity of the Stuka to fly in essence as flying artillery, the combination, the integration of that innovation created for the one side, the capacity to think, decide and act far more quickly than their opponents. So this concept of the observe, orient, uh, decide and act, the OODA loop, the OODA loop begins to collapse in a hyperwar environment. Uh, and under the, in the physical environment that I've just described, that was enough to fold up the, the French capacity to, to perceive the nature of the unfolding conflict in a, in a hyperwar environment in the future where supercomputing, big data analytics, and artificial intelligence are, are doing intelligence analysis, maybe making a decision assist or decision support or decisions themselves at speeds where the role of the human becomes the vulnerability. And our opponents will probably surrender some of those roles directly to the algorithms. This is going to be something that is going to move so quickly uh, that we have to begin to think now about how we embrace a potential for hyperwar in our recruiting, in our preparation of our young officers and leaders, uh, in our command and control systems, and, and ultimately how we will consider conflict in a hyperwar environment writ large. Ben, uh, you have had uh, so much um, important on the ground experience uh, in Europe uh, recently, uh, and thinking about uh, how uh, the United States and NATO can uh, respond to the current challenges uh, posed by uh, a variety of threats, including Russia. Um, is, you know, is the alliance right now as capable as it needs to be uh, to uh, respond to uh, uh, Russia and other uh, threatening actors right now? And then what might happen uh, as this kind of modernization uh, actually occurs? Will we be ready uh, to meet the future challenge uh, that they pose? Well, first of all, um, if we have uh, enough ships like HMS Defender uh, with women and men on board, like what we saw in action yesterday, I have no worries. Uh, I was so impressed uh, with how well they did their task and like, millions of other people watching Jonathan Bill on BBC describing almost play by play what was going on. Uh, by the way, every US Navy ship should have a professional journalist on board for that very reason. If they do go into the Black Sea or South China Sea, for example, to document what's, uh, what's happening. But, um, you know, part of the, uh, uh, our book is about the need to have real capability that's modern um, and, and of course, you still have humans that have to make it work. And, and that's what we saw in action from HMS Defender. I really was so proud uh, watching them. Of course, that's one vessel. Uh, destroyers, uh, despite the name of the type vessel, really don't have the capacity to destroy other ships anymore. They don't carry typically many anti-ship missiles. And so it's the combination of uh, vessels like Defender, but also a P-8 carrying harpoons or other uh, systems, long range missiles, it's what it's gonna to take to destroy the Black Sea Fleet, for example, if we ever got into uh, a conflict. Now your question is, you know, is NATO, is NATO capable of, of doing this? Absolutely. You get 30 nations together with the combined economies, uh, militaries, populations, that's the last thing in the world that the uh, Russian Federation wants is a, is a fight against all of NATO, which is why maintaining the coherence of the alliance is job one, making sure that it will always be 30 to one, easier said than done. Um, and if Russia were to make the terrible miscalculation that they might be able to attack Lithuania, for example, or Norway up in the Arctic or Romania, for example, it would end badly for them. The problem is we don't want it to get to that because it, be, it will be bad for all of us. Um, and then the Chinese, of course, will exploit that opportunity 
even if they didn't coordinate it with the Kremlin. So uh, this is all about deterrence. And when we have to, for effective deterrence, you have to have capability and that has to be underpinned by speed. And this is what John, of course, was referring to earlier, speed of recognition of what the heck is going on. The Russians will not do us a favor of coming over the hill with a long column of T-72s, which is what I expected in Northern Germany back in 1981. It's actually already happening, but how soon can we recognize and pick through the ambiguity in such a way that our political leaders can then make a quick decision so that we can begin movement in peacetime conditions to prevent the conflict from ever happening. That's, that's the hard part is, uh, and unfortunately, and our book is aimed at these political civilian leadership, there's a massive reluctance and disbelief that Russia would ever actually do something. I mean, I hear this all the time. Why would they do that? It makes no sense. You can't possibly believe that Russia would actually attack. I mean, that's, that's pervasive thinking uh, in most European capitals and unfortunately also in Washington because they'll say, well, look, they have the GDP of Italy. Why would they ever do it? But that's because they're thinking, we're thinking like Americans or Westerners not the way the Russians uh, do the calculus. So uh, one of the most interesting components of your book uh, is that uh, you don't actually consider uh, European um, war as something that is confined to Europe. Uh, can you explain uh, why you've opened the aperture uh, beyond what uh, might be a um, really a narrower scenario of uh, European um, or NATO confrontation with Russia uh, or the other way around, I should say. Um, why do you think it will be global? Well, um, everything else is global these days. Um, we've seen a globalization of everything. There's no reason to believe that given the interactions that uh, exist between the major powers these days that any such conflict could be confined to any one theater. And it would be more likely, given the nature of the threat that the United States could pose to them, that they would engineer multiple simultaneous crises in several theaters. So I've just finished a, a major report for the European Parliament on, on the Arctic security. And you see a growing Russian and Chinese presence in the Arctic, for example. Uh, so an enemy is not going to do what we would want it to. It's going to do exactly what we wouldn't want it to. I find it hard to believe that Russia would take a risk uh, if the Americans were present in Europe in strength. But they might take a risk if China was uh, diverting America's attention to Indo-Pacific and Europeans had to act as first responders to maintain, maintain credible deterrence in Europe. And that, that is the essential, one of the essential messages of the book, which is to Europeans, look, the United States is still committed to providing a security guarantee to Europeans, but Europeans are going to have to do far more for their own defense to maintain the very credibility of that guarantee and thus deterrence. And one only has to look at the, the daily industrial cyber attacks on Europe and the United States from China to understand that this struggle is a global struggle. And it's a struggle that crosses space, it cro cro crosses uh, territory, and it crosses domains. And the sooner that we start gripping the reality of that challenge and achieve a minimum deterrent, a minimum deterrent that simply convinces our adversaries that the price will be too high to, uh, for them to act, then we are doing our job and NATO holds. Because ultimately, what do we want? We want to convince the likes of Russia and China that a rules-based international order is in their interest too. To, to stop feeling the need to, to saber rattle to stop wasting money on huge investments that don't benefit their societies and build with the democracies uh, an order based on the rule of law and, 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 and free trade and all the things from which we've benefited and we believe they will benefit. So that is the, 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 the essential struggle that we're at the moment, uh, I believe, engaged in, which will intensify in the coming de decade. Kate, sorry, Kim. Kim, let me, if I could come in behind uh, Julian, you know, when, when an opponent looks at us, and us could be NATO, uh, us could be the broader community of democracies, and contemplates conflict, 
uh, it's going to look at two things in particular. This goes back to the nature and the character of war. Uh, it will first uh, determine whether we would potentially have the will to defend ourselves. So will is extraordinarily important and the capacity to project coherence, cohesion, uh, and ultimately to convince our opponents that we actually have the will uh, to wage war in our defense and if necessary to inflict uh, such pain uh, on them, on, on uh, aspects of their society that they value, that they really need to rethink their uh, contemplation. And the other part of it, of course, is, is the physical nature of the deterrence, which in these days is more difficult uh, to, uh, to understand because the physical nature is now complemented by the cyber nature, by the nuclear nature, the space nature, et cetera. And so it, there has to be a continuity in the, in the context of the cross-domain deterrence, but very importantly, there has to be a, a continuity in the will also. And, and to the point that you asked uh, Julian and Ben and me, uh, could we contemplate a global scenario unfolding? And we've just gotten a whiff of that just recently uh, with the large uh, Russian buildup on the Ukrainian border. Uh, it was not an insignificant buildup uh, and it attracted a lot of attention. At the same time, however, the largest incursion uh, into the area, uh, the airspace surrounding Taiwan occurred at the same time. So this could get very big, it could get very uh, bad very quickly. Uh, and so one of the points that uh, Julian and I made in a study back in 2016, 2017, is that NATO really now needs to think about China, not in the context of a NATO role in a uh, Indo-Pacific war, but there, I was just in Europe, I was there when the president was there for uh, the G7, NATO, EU, and the conversation with Putin, very senior, German leader made, a, I thought, an extraordinarily important, uh, offered a, an important insight. And it is that the center of gravity of American atten attention is shifting irrevocably and inevitably to the East. The nature of the China threat is becoming so large that while there will be an unambiguous American commitment to NATO, there is no one on the planet that can deal with the Chinese the way we can if we have to. And so the conclusion by this German leader which I really applauded, was that we NATO have to be able to do more because in the event that the pressure incur uh, increases in the Indo-Pacific, only the United States can deal with that. Perhaps the Quad as it becomes more evolved, but only the United States can deal with that. We, the Europeans, better start to think about being the first responders that, that uh, we should contemplate for. That then creates the will and it creates the appearance uh, in the cross-domain uh, environment. Uh, that begins to hammer down uh, anyone's contemplation that conflict could be successful against us. We have a wonderful queue of questions, uh, and that means you have done your job as authors uh, of inspiring the audience. I'm going to have uh, Jenny uh, Caffarella go ahead and take the questions, serve them up in the order uh, that she thinks is right for our discussion. Great. Thanks, Kim. And thanks again to all three of you for joining us today and for writing such an important book. Um, General Allen, I'd be remiss not to also thank you for your kind words. Um, it's truly a privilege of mine to work for ISW um, and to have the opportunity uh, to learn from folks like yourself. You. The first question I'll tee up is from ISW's Mason Clark, who you all know um, and is a preeminent uh, Russia scholar, and we have been so proud of his work. So he's asking a very insightful question that General Allen um, picks up on a thread that, that you offered uh, in your comments just a little bit ago. Um, his question relates to your point on the advantages our adversaries have in terms of achieving unity of action between military and non-military tools. Um, Russia, of course, has, is a, a primary example of the sophisticated um, integration of those kinds of tools. So Mason's question is, obviously, the United States should not imitate Russia's authoritarian structure, which enables them to perform that integration, uh, but first, how can we close that gap? Uh, what more can the U.S. do to offset um, our limitation in that regard? Um, and second, what advantages actually does our process provide to the United States um, that can you know, help us compete more effectively with actors like Russia and China? Well, I'll come in. Uh, and, and Mason, thanks for the question. Uh, I admire your work, um, and it's really important work. I'd say a couple of things. The authoritarian states, uh, the autocratic or the liberal states, however you want to call it, they, they enjoy a unity of vision uh, and a unity of resources that, uh, that we, don't, we don't have. And I, I'm not proposing that, uh, 
that's an advantage to them in many respects. Uh, our system, I think, has grown uh, in ways um, that is risk averse. Uh, it is intended in every possible way if the system runs on its own to prevent the potential for corruption. It has attempted to uh, create clear distinctions between the public and the private sector. Uh, no one should argue with any of that. Uh, but in many respects, layer upon layer of these safeguards over the years have made it actually quite difficult, for example, uh, to move from the, the idea of concept ultimately to the deployment of a piece of hardware in a relatively short period of time. Uh, in Europe, and uh, Julian probably has the more frequent number, but it's, it's often a decade <laughs> from concept to deployment. And by that point, our, our autocratic uh, uh, opponents who don't have to worry about those kinds of differentiations uh, are already in the second or third gen of a particular system. Um, so that's the first thing. I, and I mentioned that the linear or the figurative distance between the public and the private sector is, is really a vulnerability that I know that uh, Secretary Austin is, uh, is deeply concerned about. And we've been concerned about it for many, for administration after administration, we've not been able to crack this. Uh, the other piece of this is really important is that we talk about competing with the Chinese, for example, which are technological, technological giants compared to the Russians, but still the Russians are quite formidable. Um, uh, our, our private sector, our startup community, and our young scale-up community is actually incredibly uh, promising in the context of the technologies that they offer. It is so hard for those young organizations to crack into to get the attention of the defense innovative sector uh, that can uh, bring their technologies to bear uh, and ultimately to bring them to scale in order to provide the kinds of technological reach we need as we think through the idea of uh, hyperwar. So uh, this separation of the public private sector, uh, to Mason's point, the only way it can be solved is of course to bring them closer together. And it's easier for me, hell of a lot easier for me to say that than actually to do that. Um, but if you don't like the amount of time that it takes for the private sector ultimately to support the public sector movements in, in, into a hyper-war environment, uh, then there's only one solution and that's to bring them far earlier into the requirements process. And often it's a matter of classification. The nature of the conversations that generate the concepts are so highly classified that the private sector doesn't get into it until you know, relatively late. Uh, but Mason's point is really important. And it, it is an advantage that our opponents have that we don't. Our advantage, however, is that the, the system ultimately that produces the weapon system uh, is one that is, you know, it's, it, it's, it's legally uh, uh, defendable, uh, it's, it's ethically supportable, and it, uh, uh, it, it reduces the opportunity for corruption. But so much of that has slowed us down in many respects. Could, Kim, could I uh, just slightly disagree with uh, with John? I, I I would prefer our way than the other way a million times out of a million. I, I don't see big advantage in, in the Russian or Chinese system. Nobody in the world or certainly nobody in Europe or North America is interested in buying anything manufactured by the uh, Russians with the exception of perhaps the S-400. Everybody is trying to get rid of Russian made equipment as fast as they possibly can, because yes, our our modernization processes can be uh, incredibly frustrating, but it is the the nature of who we all are that generates the innovation necessary to create the best possible stuff. You know, my great army. Uh, we have a pretty sad record here in the last thirty years for modernization uh, on, on getting platforms done. So there's plenty of problems associated with it. Still, I, I think I prefer, and getting the requirement right, John's exactly right there. You gotta get the requirement right early and then stick with it um, versus adding things you know, as it goes along. Uh, as far as you know, having allies too, Churchill's great quote about uh, the only thing worse than uh, fighting with allies is fighting without them. And so I, I would prefer our challenge anytime. Nobody's knocking on the door of the Kremlin to join their team. Let me, let me come back in. I didn't say that I wanted uh, to adopt the Russian or the Chinese system. There was no part of my conversation. What I'm saying is that the difference 
uh, between the location of the private sector and the public sector creates a timeline that we better either be willing to accept that our opponents don't have to worry about, or we should think about how we streamline that timeline ultimately to optimize the capacity to bring technology into our defense requirement systems much more, much earlier. Let the record show that the distinguished gentleman from Virginia clarified my, my misrepresentation of what he said. <laughs> Thank you both. So we have another great question. Um, this one from Jeff Becker from the Joint Staff J7 of Futures and Concepts uh, that relates to this thread. Uh, the question is, a large part of military change is not just about what capabilities we should buy, but what should be left behind. Uh, what things are we too heavily invested in today um, that are not suited for the emerging character of war or what needs to be left behind uh, to make room for the capabilities that are better suited uh, for hyper war? I'll ask that to the full group. Ben, you've had some great thoughts on that. Do you, you want to come in? I can come in behind you or Julia? Well, I, I would say three things. Uh, first of all, uh, we have got to improve intelligence sharing. Uh, or, you know, our president has emphasized the importance of working with allies. Uh, everything that we're doing now in, in Europe and in the Indo-Pacific, as well as the Middle East, is in multinational formations at the tactical level like never before. And so um, we can't rely just on five eyes for intelligence sharing that our Estonian and Lithuanian and, and Ukrainian friends will know more about Russia than we'll know in a thousand years. Uh, same thing for China when it comes to allies in the Indo-Pacific region. So we have got to take advantage of technology that, that protects uh, uh, networks against a constant barrage, but still allows rapid sharing this hyperspeed that John talked about. Uh, the second thing, you know, it's, the tank has been dying for decades, but yet everybody still needs protected mobile firepower. Whether it's 70 tons, which I think is too much, um, or it's robotic or uh, an unmanned turret, something. You know, the, the video we watched in Nagorno-Karabakh of endless numbers of armed vehicles being destroyed was not because the tank is obsolete. And by, I'm not a tanker, by the way, I'm a light instrument. Um, what we saw was, one side with technology um, employed in operational design that took advantage of the technology against another side that was using old technology and was clearly untrained, undisciplined, and did not know how to protect themselves in the new environment. So it's not the death of the tank, it's about who has the superior design in using the technology as John used in his earlier historical examples. Yeah, if I can, Ben really hit it, uh, hit the nail on the head that, and the J7's question is, is where we live today. Um, uh, Michelle Floor and I just had a terrific piece in foreign affairs uh, about, are we at an inflection point? And uh, Lloyd Austin, you know, God love him. He's got some really tough uh, calls to make uh, because we are absolutely eyeball deep in legacy systems that did our country and our allies and, and the peace of the world good service for a very, very long time. But the march of technology is so dramatic. Uh, to Ben's point, the effects that we seek from those technologies, ultimately, as we, as we wanna wield those effects for deterrence, uh, may drive us in different directions than the kinds of legacy systems that we have. But we have to live with those systems. And so what you find with the advancing technology is you have, you have an integrative phase where you're in attempting to integrate new technologies into legacy systems, which becomes extraordinarily expensive over time. And then you have a, a requirement for innovation, which may take you completely in a very different direction than those legacy platforms. Uh, and if, you, if you're con condemned ultimately to uh, innovation and modernization in a platform centric way, which is based upon legacy platforms, it, you almost can't get there from here. So, uh, Secretary Austin has got to live with legacy platforms for some period of time and integrate new technologies into them. At the same time, we have to stimulate innovative thinking that can take us away from the current legacy platforms to, to achieve the effects-based uh, requirements or the effects-based uh, effects that we wanna have ultimately with these new technologies. It's a, it's a wicked problem. And I don't envy him the problem, but look, we gotta solve that now. I mean, for Europeans, this is, a, this is a real dilemma. We, in the book, we call it the dreadnought dilemma because back in 1906, the Royal Navy uh, launched the HMS Dreadnought, the first or all big gun, fully armored, uh, turbine driven battleship. And at a stroke, 
she made every other battleship in the world obsolete. But of course, the country with the most battleships was Britain. So Britain had just made its own battle fleet obsolete, which meant that having made the technological jump, we then had to invest huge amounts of resources in dreadnoughts and super dreadnoughts. Uh, we solved it in a very British way. Uh, at one point, the government wanted uh, six. The opposition wanted four. So Parliament settled on eight super dreadnoughts, which was a very British solution to a particular dilemma. Um, so, you know, that's for Europeans, that's a big problem. What that tends to lead to, given how small the scale is in Europe, it's almost a kind of commitment to legacy to have something. And then on top of that, you have far too much of European defense budgets are spent on O&M, spent on personnel issues, and not enough on the force itself. And in the book, what we identify is what I call the interoperability cooperability threat. That the US accelerates so rapidly, so fast away from most European allies, the Brits and the French will kind of keep up. That when we deploy together, we'll be more of a risk to ourselves than we are to the enemy. Because the, 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 the breadth and depth of systems between US forces and its allies will be so great that command will be so complicated and the very opposite of the kind of integrated defense that NATO Europeans really should be aiming at. And here, I fully agree with Secretary of Defense Sir Austin. Uh, and the US has got to drive Europeans towards this because if that German politician is to come good on his commitment, then Germany and the other Western Europeans in particular really have to change their ways. And I'm afraid that will require the US being very blunt about the pressures on you guys if we are then to make the kind of changes to our legacies which are frankly vitally overdue. Kim? Thank you. I'm going to turn over to Jenny because the, the queue is growing uh, and full of great questions. It really is, which is quite fun. Um, I will pose the next question to the group. Um, it is from an ISW supporter, Don Smith, uh, who asked an insightful question about whether the conventional weapons development, including how far missile technology is uh, evolving to become increasingly lethal, whether that is actually making conventional war somewhat untenable uh, in a model similar to how nuclear war um, has actually you know, created a new threshold. So I'll pose that to the full group. Um, I'll, I'll come in. Um, I think as we see once again, the, the relationship of the character with the nature of war as uh, physical uh, technological improvements, uh, increased lethality or increased capability, we have to understand what the full capacity uh, of that uh, technology uh, can bring in terms of the, advantage, the relative advantages that we can achieve in the battle space. Uh, and what these technologies do by and large is it both accelerates our capacities uh, in conflict vis-a-vis -vis our opponent, uh, but in almost every case, uh, if it's a useful technology for us in the context of weapon systems, it also increases our uh, precision, uh, the precision guidance. So something that moves faster and has more precision uh, would inherently, I think, uh, be a major contribution to our capacity to wage conflict in the physical domain. But what's important, of course, is to remember uh, that we're not just waging uh, war in the physical domain. It's a multi-domain conflict from space uh, through the multiple uh, physical dimensions and then into cyber. Uh, and, and so any one particular weapon system improvement uh, for us, if we're thinking properly, we want to think about what that capable capability improvement does across all the domains to give us the capacity for a, a full domain capacity, uh, full, full domain uh, capability. Um, so it's not double talk. Uh, it, it is, we, we can't see one, we should not see one technological change in isolation. We need to consider how that technological change fits across all of our capabilities, uh, across all of the domains. If I can add to that, I, th I think the, the core issue here is deterrence, the nature of deterrence. Um, deterrence itself is, is expanding, not, not just in terms of if, if NATO is deterring Russia, it must also deter China as well uh, with the US because of the increasing interlocked nature of, of those relationships. But deterrence also starts across an information spectrum, a cyber spectrum, and then into conventional and nuclear force spectrums. So there's a whole uh, uh, a litany now of, of advanced coercive tools that could be used against open societies, 
against which we have to deter. Uh, because let's face it, if we were decapitated politically in Europe, at the early stages of a, of, of a conflict, which the scenario in the book addresses, then the willingness of European leaders to respond, particularly if an attack was only on the margins of NATO, I'd find it hard to believe that, say, Berlin, Paris, or London would say, do, do, you know, are we willing, really willing to go to, to, to a potential hyper war with, with, with the Russians or the Chinese or whoever, whoever over that kind of scenario? So it's absolutely vital that, that, that we understand the, the changing relationship between technology and deterrence as we craft our policies. We have a chance with all that's happening with NATO, with the new strategic concept coming up, with the NATO 2030 agenda, to really start thinking conceptually. Because if we're going to generate advantage, we've got to think advantage first. What is it that would give us advantage given who we are? against adversaries like Russia, China, and whomsoever. So there's an opportunity here, but we need to think creatively about what we're seeking to generate. If, if I may, just because we're talking about future war and hybrid threats, that doesn't mean there's not a place for steel. I mean, what were we all glued to on TV the last two months? It was Russian tanks, Russian artillery, Russian paratroopers, and Russian ships. I mean, very conventional tight capabilities and if we don't have the, the capabilities to defeat and overmatch that then they will use tanks just like it was 1940 uh and and ships and also what are we worried about in china yes long-range missiles but also you know their massive shipbuilding program that is underway moving at the same sort of tempo that the u.s was building ships in 1942 and 43 and 44. so um one does not exclude the other let me just add as well, as I said a few minutes ago, the whole idea of will is central to the credibility of deterrence. Uh, and I, I hope we haven't missed the fact that in a phase zero environment, uh, the Russian strategic influence operation and the Chinese to some extent, but the Russians in particular using uh, artificially intelligent micro targeting capabilities is attacking that most important aspect of our deterrence, which is the six inches between our ears. Uh, and as that creates greater uh, crises of confidence in the minds of Europeans and Americans about whether we would ever go to war against the Russians, uh, or it creates a greater crisis of confidence in the minds of uh, members of democracies about whether uh, democracy is an efficacious system of government at all. That is a direct assault upon the will of our peoples ultimately to defend ourselves, which is, I think, why especially in the, in the most recent uh, NATO communique, and it goes exactly to the scenarios of our book, the one at the beginning, which is goes, goes badly, and one at the end that works out. This goes to the issue of creating societal resilience. Uh, and I, uh, Julian touched it, uh, Ben has touched it. We can't overestimate, we can't overstate how important the requirement is for us to push back upon artificially intelligent disinformation capabilities with bots, et cetera, which is aimed directly uh, at that most vulnerable part of our deterrence, which is our will, ultimately. In fact, uh, John, in the book, uh, you introduce uh, or discuss the concept of hyper deterrence. Uh, and although uh, there's a huge queue of questions, I am confident uh, that our audience would love to hear a little bit more about what hyper deterrence might be uh, and what it might entail. Uh, and uh, I hope um, I hope you'll explicate. Julian, you want to come in on that one? <clears throat> yeah, hybrid deterrence is a logical consequence of 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 the hybrid war, cyber war, hyper war spectrum, which is central to the book. Uh, deterrence is about messaging, um, and if there is a a new concept of the conduct of the character and nature of warfare, you've got to keep demonstrating to your adversary that you've understood that and you have the means and the will to meet them at every level of engagement and in all the complexities of complex strategic coercion. So deterrence is getting wider because the number of coercive tools in what we call 5D warfare is, is increasing and being applied systematically against open societies. But because the nature of war, the conduct of warfare itself is accelerating exponentially because of technology, You've got to convince an adversary that you can match that. Now, you can convince them that you can match them via speed, 
hyper speed, or if you haven't got the speed to match their destructive uh, capabilities, i.e. They, they, they can threaten to destroy your very functioning as a society without returning resorting to nuclear weapons, sheer by the sheer nature of those technologies applied against you, then hyper can also mean a hyper threat in terms of destructive power. And that in, involves nuclear weapons as well. So they've got to understand an adversary that whatever they do, they're going to incur a great cost for embarking on an attack against one. And, and that's why uh, that's why we call it hyper deterrence, uh, both in terms of speed and breadth and, and in fact, impact of, 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 uh, of messaging. Super, we have a ton of wonderful questions on the thread. I'm going to turn to Jenny, but um, I actually want to acknowledge uh, one of the uh, great Americans on the thread um, whose son, uh, John, served in Helmand. Uh, and I want to uh, thank you uh, for your service uh, as a parent of an incredibly brave American. Um, Jenny, to the queue. Great. The next question follows up on the uh, thread of deterrence um, and asks, what are the requirements going to be for managing escalation in a hyper war scenario, uh, which is, of course, part a political set of decisions as well as military? Slava, first track at that one. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, yeah. I'll just simply say I think it's going to be extraordinarily difficult and we've got to start to think about it right now. We really do. Uh, this... uh, I, I lead a bilateral uh, delegation that talks with the Chinese uh, about uh, the implementation of artificial intelligence uh, in the defense and, and uh, security sectors. Uh, and one of the challenges, one of the things that concerns us both is the, uh, the automation, if you will, of decision making uh, or autonomous decision making that can occur in the con context of a hyperwar environment where uh, the management of escalation can be uh, extraordinarily difficult. We've got to start to think about that now. We've got to think about whether we will take uh, with our potential adversaries, just as we talked to the Soviets during the worst moments of the Cold War uh, on arms control, given the potential destructiveness of some of these new technologies, uh, which could exceed the potential for nuclear destructiveness in some ways, uh, we need to be thinking about what behaviors and standards of, of uh, conduct uh, and limitations we may want to place on some of these technologies to do just what that very important question uh, asks, which is how do we manage uh, an escalatory process in a hyperwar environment where we could end up uh, surrendering control of some of the most destructive or disruptive technologies to, if you will, the middle ground between the nature and the character of war, which is a, a, a emerging algo, algorithmic autonomy that we've got to be very careful about. It is the potential for the first time to see the nature of war in some respects rendered in a different way in this uh, complex uh, equation that was set out for us by Clausewitz. Um, and one of the conversations we've had, it's a very difficult conversation, is will there ever be, should there ever be, uh, and artificially intelligent dimension to nuclear command and control. Uh, and if you want to talk about things that keep you up at night, uh, having an AI supported nuclear command and control system is something that I worry about a lot. And let me just turn it over to George. Well, this is the future of arms control that John's talking about. It's it is. absolutely crucial. And for NATO, this is a real dilemma because what we're talking about here, it's an automaticity of response which involves devolved command authority to succor, which is far greater than anything we have today. And the North Atlantic Council and the various member nations of the Alliance would find that extremely difficult to countenance. NATO is a talk shop uh, and, it, and that's an important function. It's, it, you know, the, the idea of political consultations as we saw in the summit communique last week are hugely important. NATO needs to be that forum. And I fear that unless the Alliance can find a way to resolve this genuine dilemma, the danger is that the US and maybe a couple of other allies like the UK and France, in a real emergency would simply step outside of the institutional framework and operate under US leadership. And that NATO would then come in at D plus 60 or something because it would take that long for the force structure to start to move, for the agreement to be had, 
all sorts of issues. The adversary would not be sitting back, uh, would be trying to influence various member nations in various ways to slow NATO down. And so in a sense, the, the defense and security guarantee that's implicit in deterrence, ironically, might require the United States to step outside the institutional framework to reinforce NATO. It's a paradox of, of the hyperwar impact on, on, on the alliance. Thanks so much for those comments. And there was also a comment um, in the, the Q&A regarding what the Turks are doing, um, of course, within the NATO alliance. But there are some examples um, in the reporting of Turkish drones making autonomous decisions um, that included lethal strikes. Um, so certainly a challenge you know, that's, that's already here um, and, and within the alliance. And this is a big issue for us. And um, you know, the whole issue of fully autonomous lethal systems uh, is an area that has uh, uh, has our as it should be uh, because we are committed to human rights and the uh, uh, well just human rights in, in in particular many other aspects of it but uh, are we as a nation committed to the rule of law which is international humanitarian law law of armed conflict etc are we prepared ever to surrender decisions on target engagement to a fully autonomous lethal uh, weapon system uh, we're not there yet, um, and I don't know that we'll ever be there. And this is one of the dilemmas because if our opponents have, and you're, you just mentioned it, Jenny, I don't like calling the Turks our opponents, but that system is going to end up in someone's hand that is an opponent. Uh, if our opponents have made that that, that surrendered that uh, kind of decision making and engagement uh, uh, discretion, uh, now they're faster than we are, and and that's the challenge that we're going to face as we move in towards a hyperwar environment. We are closing in on the end of uh, time and we are not closing in on the queue of questions. There are so many phenomenal questions here. Uh, and I'm actually going to send them to you, um, uh, gentlemen, uh, not so that you can answer them, but because I think that they're, uh, they reflect really smart ideas by incredibly smart people uh, thinking about the very hard questions that you raised. Uh, let me uh, ask you to close though with one key takeaway uh, that we haven't covered yet uh, that you would like our audience members to take away. Um, and we can go ahead and start with Julian. Thank you. Uh, with the growing overstretch of US forces potentially worldwide, it is vital the three leading Western European powers, the UK, France, and Germany, do not fall out catastrophically over Brexit and maintain cohesion to such a point where they lead the strengthening European deterrent with inside the Alliance and generate the European future force, which is able and capable to operate at a high end as a first responder across the multi-domain. Thank you, Kim. Ben? Um, first, I want to say uh, how much I enjoyed doing these things with my two uh, teammates, uh, John Allen and uh, Julian Lindley French, uh, not only professional respect, but personal. Um, I remember John Allen in between his uh, time in Afghanistan spending time with my son because we lived in the same neighborhood. And I'm, you know, my, I'll never forget that. Um, it's going to be a very long, hot summer uh, in Ukraine and in the Black Sea. I mean, it's bad. Uh, I, could, I could hear the sighs of relief from Berlin and Brussels and Paris from where I live here in Frankfurt after Minister Shoigu said, okay, the exercise is over, everybody go back to barracks. Nobody above the rank of Lieutenant believes for a second that they went back. All that stuff is still there. Um, and uh, I, I was as a pod coming up in uh, September. Um, I think we're gonna have to watch very, very carefully what Russian forces are doing in the air, land and sea and in all the other domains in and around Ukraine. Um, they know that we're all going on holiday or we're dreaming about China and that Germany is having elections and that most of Europe would rather do anything than have to face up to the reality of who the Kremlin leadership really is. And the Chinese are going to be watching how we respond to all that. So I think I'm, I'm worried about a very long, hot summer in uh, the Black Sea region. Kim, I'll be very brief. Thank you first for... Uh... Uh, the incredibly uh, valuable moment for us. We learn every time we have the opportunity to, to talk. Uh, ISW is an incredibly important entity right now. So for your supporters on the phone, uh, commit heresy here as the president of Brookings and, and tell you, thank you for your support to ISW. I mean, it's just an incredible organization. 
And finally, I'll just boil all of this down. This, this, this all boils down to an issue of values. Uh, NATO is an entity that has coherence in many respects because of our values, the EU because of the values, the transatlantic relationship, the community of democracies. And as technology uh, it continues to evolve at speeds we just couldn't have imagined just 10 years ago, as technology continues to evolve, it's gonna pressurize those values. And if we're true to who we are and what we stand for, uh, we will take those technologies and wield them consistent with our values to maintain a position of deterrent advantage over our opponents. And they're just gonna to have to understand if you, if you wanna screw with that many democracies who have unified their values and aggregated their technologies to improve our deterrence, then you're gonna pay for it in ways you cannot begin to imagine. Uh, and I think that's the message from my perspective. Technology is values neutral. The technology takes on a value by virtue of the, of the characteristic of the state that employs it. And so long as we're true to our values, I think we're going to be fine. It'll increase, increase our confidence in our deterrence, as well as the physical nature of our deterrence. So thank you very much, Kim, for the opportunity today. Well, uh, thank you, John, Julian, and Ben. Uh, and thank you, audience, for joining the Institute for the Study of War. Uh, I recommend, once again, uh, that you rush out, buy the book, um, The Future of War in the Defense of Europe. There are many fantastic questions that you have asked that are answered in there, um, and that I'm sure will be the basis for future uh, discussions. I cannot thank you uh, three authors enough uh, for what you are doing uh, to help us think about the strategic challenges that we face, uh, as well as the character uh, of who we are uh, as a uh, democracy, whether here in the United States or overseas in Europe, and the character of who we are as an alliance. Uh, our security rests uh, on our values, uh, as well as on our will and capabilities. Thank you all for joining, uh, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, everyone. Good day. <laughs>